On Calvary, to save a wretch like me, I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood, blood alone. Then I repented of my sins, and one. Welcome, sing along with me, you know this song. Welcome to our Turning on the Lights, Wednesday Morning Word. I know you know this song. I heard about his healing of his power. Everybody, turning on the lights, Wednesday morning word edition. Welcome to all of our friends from WPFG FM 91.3. Trust me, I'm trying to get more episodes recorded. I really, really am. 
Um, you would think that in the midst of all of this craziness, hey, pastors, they just sit down and relax. <laughs> no. And then yesterday when I thought, hey, I've got a little bit of time. We've had this work team at the church ready to go. I could show it to you. There was a gigantic hole in our roof yesterday. I'm just checking out the, just checking out the, the feed here to see. Let me turn it down so I can see some of the comments. Um, the comments that I check, it's going out over a lot of different feeds. Good morning, everybody. Megan, Stacy, Marty, Don, Jeff, Don, Lisa. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the the, the <clears throat> excuse me. The comments that I'll check because I can only monitor one feed at a time are on Brian D. Warner. But I want you to watch, and if you want to comment, I will get to all of the comments on all of the feeds. Um, is that still too high? Right? Is that okay? Is the sound okay? Because I had to back it down. Yesterday I realized when I sung that sound blew up the Mebo mic and it was clipping it. It was clipping it, meaning it's too much, so it clips it off and then you get blank spots. This, and that may be why people are saying, hey, the sound was cutting in and out, man. Don't want that to happen as well. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Turning on the lights, Wednesday morning word edition. For Wednesday morning word, what we do is we are very, very intentional about getting inside the word of God. And this is when also, like I said, we welcome in all of our friends from 91.3 and uh, we just get into it for about a half an hour now. We just want to get into it. We're going to take a look at <clears throat> something that I've been taking a look at as I'm, you, you, you know, as a pastor, um, I don't don't take this the wrong way. Or, you know, it just, but when you come across Easter and Christmas, and every, every pastor, every lay person who's preached, every, as we approach this, those events and those scriptures speak for themselves. Now, to be sure, there are Old Testament prophecy, New Testament revelations, all things that you can, you can um, build around that preaching, but that preaching preaches itself. I mean, Christ is risen. What is Brian Warner going to do from the pulpit to say, hey, Christ is risen and, you know, I mean, <laughs> you can say and he is at the right hand of God, the father, you know, that sort of thing. But you know what I'm saying? How do you how do you come across the preaching for Advent seasons and Christmas and Easter? And instead of just looking at that and saying, oh, throw in the towel, just, you know, preach. I really use it as a challenge to try to come up with. Okay, what is being said about these events around the events? We will never forsake the traditional scriptures of both. I mean, we want to hear them every year. We want to revel in them every year. We want to take great peace and power, joy in them every year. But as we teach, and I'm teaching a course in a few weeks on systematic theology for the MTI. There's a plug. In a couple of weeks, I'm beginning an intentional Bible study through the book of Romans, through the MTI. So I'll give you more information on that. That's going to be an hour and a half twice a week through the book of Romans. So there's a lot going on, a lot going on. And it really is neat to be thought of as a person who is capable of doing this sort of thing. So um, anyway, um, this is what systematic theology is all about. It's when you, we look at an event in the Bible, a scriptural event, obviously, the life, the death, the resurrection of Christ, or we look at a, a, a particular piece of theology, God's redemptive nature, God's loving nature, God's, that sort of thing, God's wrath for those who will not turn, that sort of thing. And you, you see it, the, you, you study the thread, you see the thread all throughout the scriptures. That's a systematic approach. So let's look at God's love from Genesis through Revelation. Whoa, 66 books covering thousands of years and the definition really has not changed. And we can look at it here and there and everywhere. And God's love measured with his justice, his mercy and his wrath. Boom, it's there. Like there aren't five, six different types of God in there. And that's what systematic theology does. So this is a, a little bit of that. There's a little piece of that every, all throughout the year, but every Advent season and every um, Christmas season, Easter season, 
There's a little systematic approach. Where else is this being preached? Where else are these things being taught? So I've been looking for the Easter story in the Gospel of Luke and the, you know, the passion and the resur uh, 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 crucifixion and the resurrection through the Gospel of Luke. But then I turned over to 1 Corinthians. Well, 1 Corinthians, preach and resurrection. There's an amazing chapter of 1 Corinthians that preaches resurrection. Um, and it is tied directly to the love of God. And so I want to take a little bit of time and look at that. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians um, 15. I said 14. Man, that's the second mistake I've made this week. Can you believe it? It's only Wednesday, and I've made two mistakes. Second, three mistakes. First Corinthians 15. There's a beautiful gem. Now, when we study Scripture, this is one of the things that we talk about at Churchtown. When we look at Scripture, when we preach from Scripture, one of the things that we try to do is ignore all of the chapter, verses, subheadings of the Bible. Because we can get caught up in this idea, especially the way that we do education in America, is that Jesus taught classes that he would gather for 45 minutes and teach about this. And then he would stop. And then he would gather again and teach about this. And the way that the Bible is randomly divided into chapter, verse, and then the way that the um, translators uh, and editors have put in these subheadings makes us think that. So if we can get rid of those, ignore those, and see the continuum of Holy Spirit teaching in the Word of God, it really, really can be eye-opening. And so we look at this as our first piece of business with this text. Let's go back to 13. And what is, what is God talking about there through Paul? Talking about the very nature of God. And we've already brought this up in, in part of our conversation. The very nature of God is, let me hear it, love. And he goes on and on and on. And he talks about even other comparative godly traits let alone the gifts and the uh, things that I inherit as a creature. He goes through all of those, and he says, even if I could do all of those things, I'm still but a creature. I'm still but a creature. And God's very nature overwhelms my nature. There is no way, regardless of how I may be even inspired because I'm trapped in this flesh, regardless of what, how many talents or gifts or how smart I actually really am, <sighs> flatlined compared to the overwhelming nature of God. Right? And, and this is what he's beginning or actually culminating to talk about. There... Three things will last forever at the end of this. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And so this is a commentary on God's very nature because it opens, right? 13 opens at the end of 12 and he says, but now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And 13 closes with three things will last forever forever faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. So now we're getting a context for what's coming next. And the, and the teaching continues. That wasn't a class on love. As we read scripture, we got to stop viewing that, excuse me, as a class on love. Paul didn't sit down there and by the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, teach a class about love. Now, we're going to completely change and teach about something else. When we take this approach to Scripture, we look at the continuum of teaching. 
And it does, it, there's, there's a wide variety. Sometimes it builds steadily, one concept on top of the other. Sometimes it does stop and something new begins. Sometimes it is in a chronological context where we get a period of time. And then we see day one, day two, day three, day four, and how Jesus himself through the Gospels taught it out. Right? So there's all of these different pericopes, all of these different individual contexts, but very rarely do we have anything just standing in isolation. Paul says, sit down now. It's Tuesday at 1.30. I'm going to teach you about God's love. Next Thursday is our next class, and we will be teaching about the resurrection. Nope, 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 nope. Somehow, some way, those things are connected so good morning to everybody. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're, um, oh, we do, Jeff. And I can't get all of the comments, like I said, but, um, and I don't really know everybody who's watching through all of the different a uh, avenues that we have there, all the different outlets. But uh, we're talking a little bit about uh, 1 Corinthians. We're talking about God. We're talking about systematic theology. We're talking about a hermeneutic. I don't want to scare anybody off, but these terms really are fancy terms for simple concepts. The hermeneutic that you use is the lens through which you're viewing the scripture. Do you want to look at it, just to name some of the superficial hermeneutics, do you want to look at it chronologically? Do you want to look at it historically? Do you want to look at it theologically? What does it say about the nature of God? Do you want to look at it through the lens of what does it say about the nature of man? Do you want to look at it, right, contextually, culturally, in how the uh, Hebrews religion was embedded in a world of polytheism? All of these lenses through which you can study scripture. And so the hermeneutic that we are approaching, uh, using, is really contextual and theological. We want to know about God, right? And, and that is the purpose, point and purpose, fundamentally, fundamentally the point and purpose of good expository preaching. You learn about God, what he did, what he does. And then finally, how you fit into that equation. Because church and teaching and the word of God are meant to glorify me. No, God. We learn about him, we glorify and we exalt God. It is literally, and you know, how I fit into that scheme comes after that. Because I do. And we looked at Genesis and uh, crowning achievement and, and, you know, separate and distinct category, fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah. I'm important, but he's importanter, right? So we want to learn. And if, I, if I'm created in his image and his likeness, the less I know about God, follow my thinking here, the less I know about myself. The more I know about God, the more I know about myself. And I don't start learning things about myself according to what the world is telling me. I start learning things about myself according to what the word of God is telling me. Does that make sense? And that's really important thus to understand the very nature of God. Because I'm created in his image. Ooh, the more I know about him, the more I know about me. It's pretty cool stuff. It's pretty cool stuff. So we're looking at love. We're looking at love here. Um, and then he talks about the gifts. He's talking about the spirit of God. He's talking about the spirit of God in the individual. He's talking about in chapter 14, the spirit of God in the church. He's talking about how that plays out for individuals and how that plays out in the church. He's instructing in the big picture of it all. He's telling this church that this is what makes church church. If you want to look at the, here's another big word, meta-narrative of this chapter, it is this. You are different. When you are gathered in his name as a submitted congregation to the power of God, 
and you are under the possession of God's Holy Spirit, that is what separates you from the world. Now he's going to talk about what that looks like in terms of tongues and gifts and the active gifts, all that different stuff. But what he's saying is you're not going to find that out there. The things that you are going to be able to see, worldview, spiritually, the things that you are going to be able to do, the things that are going to be manifest through you, and he makes this very clear, are not designed for your glorification. This is one area where we, we slide right into the gifts, especially, I will say, the charismatic gifts, and we neglect the teaching of order and we neglect the teaching that all gifts manifest in the individual or the church are designed to draw others to God. We've got to be clear on that. Who comes first? God, 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 me. Right? So if, if, I'm, if I'm like, look at me, look at me, everybody. I can do this, I can do, I got this gift, I got that gift, watch, watch, look at me. Ah. But if there is a gift, a spiritual giftings that God has given me, Perhaps it is to teach. Perhaps it is to preach. I need to be even careful then because how I do it and why I do it should be to get all of your eyes pointed whoop up. I once did a, do you see the stained glass behind me? Let me see that. You see that? Now that's a very traditional, very beautiful uh, picture, stained glass, Christ uh, at Gethsemane. Um, praying and um, one Sunday I was, it was it's been a while now but one Sunday I was preaching this from scripture that all preaching all teaching all scripture points to God and I, um, I, I, I did this object lesson which I, I don't often do actually I'm usually straight expository um, but I went out I said what's going on here and I, people were thrown off I said I just I I'm not going to do this anymore. And I walked out and I had already pre-staged a ladder. And I brought the ladder in and I set it up and I stood in front. Where is it? In front of that stained glass. I said, you're looking at him. Don't you hear my preaching? You should be looking at me. Your eyes should, you know, and so I was making a counterpoint to what, you know, I was preaching. And I used that. I preached from the ladder for a while to really drive home the point that, your scripture reading, your scripture study, the gifts of the spirit that you may possess, all of those things. The way that we gather for church, and so much of church is to glorify the human today. Um, and the church is meant to edify the church, one another, for the glorification of God. The more we know about him, the more we know about ourselves. The more we know about him, the more we know about church. The more we know about him, the more we know about our purpose. The more we know about him, the more we know about our image, how we are to operate in the kingdom of God and how we are to operate when we're dealing with folks outside the kingdom of God. That's really what all the letters are about. Jesus, much of Jesus' preaching is about that. Much of the teaching in the letters is how do we treat one another in the kingdom of God and how do we interact with those outside of the kingdom of God? Okay? So you see the context. You see the hermeneutic leading up to this teaching about, okay, now he's going to say, how is all of this possible? You, this is the nature of God over all of the earth. This is how the nature of God infiltrates, shall you say, on earth today. It inbreaks. It creates the kingdom of God on earth in your heart and in the church today. And it is love, man. It is love. And it is not the worldly definition of love, that anything goes, love is love. Ooh, I can't stand that saying. Love is not love. If you've never heard me preach this, love is not love, right? There is a thousand and one earthly definitions of love, and then there is God's love. And God's love says, I love you so much that I will never not tell you the truth about salvation, 
about sin, about repentance, about turning and casting your eyes up and submitting yourself, body, soul, and spirit to your creator and being indwelled by God's Holy Spirit, transforming you, transforming you, sometimes radically, transforming you into the individual that he sees. So you can get out of here with all this. Love is love, man. Why are you a hater? Not a hater. I love you so much that I have to tell you this because this will save your soul for now and for eternity. The church is too scared these days. We're just scared. We're just people, right? Read Romans 6, 7, 8. We're just people, and we're scared. Uh, and I say that collectively because I'm part of the church. I had a, a pastor friend. Yesterday's <clears throat> commentary struck a nerve with a lot of people. If you haven't checked it, um, it's on the YouTube channel. It's on my news or my Facebook feed. But I really shared the heart of the matter here. Um, <clears throat> But it struck a nerve with a lot of people because, and, and then I had it in one of those conversations, the pastor said, I preach these sorts of things about God and his love and the, and the nature of it, and I, I'm just yelled at. I'm divisive. Yeah, you are divisive. I said, and I don't know if it was the answer he expected or not. I said, good. That's a good sign. Right? That's a good sign. It's, it kind of sucks. I want to be liked as much as anybody wants to be liked. I'm as vain as the next person. I don't want to be known as negative, negative, negative things. But I can't not preach the truth about the transformational love of Jesus Christ on the cross and the value of your spirit to him. You know. All right. Let me now remind you. <clears throat> All right. Talked about orderly worship. Talked about the gifts. Talked about how the God is a God of order, even with all of these gifts active in the church. Keep all of that in mind. It's all founded on God's love, and God's love is made possible by the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit within us. Woo! And then he says, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before <clears throat> you welcomed it then. Or before you welcomed it then and you still stand firm in it it's encouraging it is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message i told you unless of course you believe something that was never true in the first place and again inside the church outside the church we're preaching things that are not true even in the first place and we're and we're standing on them and we're we're going to ride that train right through the gates of hell and we've we've got to be bolder than that. We have to be, we have to, we have to be less afraid. <laughs> I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins. Just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. Just as the scriptures said, he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. <clears throat> then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of all apostles. In fact, I am not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it, was all, it is all because God poured out his favor upon me. Can you talk about claiming things in scripture? How about we claim that? Can you claim that? And we talked about that yesterday as well. Can you claim what I am now? By the grace of God, I am. What I am now is simply because God poured out his love upon me. 
But by the grace of God, I am no longer, and every individual watching, fill in the blank, I am no longer this, that, the other thing. By the grace of God, I have been saved and, and transformed, and I walk in the Spirit of God every single day. I cherish every breath that I take, and I worship Him for showing me Him. First of all, remember who comes first? For showing me him and then showing me me. <clears throat> it's good stuff. <clears throat> it's really good stuff. But whatever I am now, can we claim this as an individual? It is all because God poured out his special favor on me. Amen. And not without results. For I've worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I but God who was working through me by his grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message. You have already believed. Now, I wanted to stop there. There's just about the resurrection of the dead, and we're going to talk more about that moving forward into Easter, and we're going to be taking this recounting of God's love, God's sacrifice, God's resurrection and ascension. This accounting in 1 Corinthians 15 and looking at the passion and the crucifixion and the resurrection through the gospel of Luke. And that's the way that I've chosen to approach it this year. But man, we've looked at the context leading into 1 Corinthians 15. It's not written or taught in a vacuum. God's Holy Spirit through Paul is building up and showing you the foundation of the gospel message. The gospel message just didn't fly down out of the sky in a vacuum either. Like, no clue this was going to happen. There's a rich contextual history to the Christ on earth, right? To God incarnate. We know that it was called for. It was prophesied. We know that it happened. And we know that there is prophecy of time yet to come. And there is zero reason to believe that every prophecy, every promise made will not occur, will not happen, will not be kept. Zero reason, because all of the other ones were. <clears throat> it was all written after the... No, it wasn't all written after the fact. Very unique, very distinct authors, different genres of literature, different epochs of time. We're talking millennia here, gathered up with one message about one God, about one salvation, about one love. It's amazing. It's amazing. So your homework, continue on with that. Read Luke from the Passion on, with that like 24 on, and read Corinthians. Go 12, 13, 14, and 15, and see what we're talking about. Look at the continuation. Ignore the chapters and ignore the subheadings, and read as it was originally written, as Paul is teaching to the church. And spend your time immersed in the word and remember what the purpose is. You got that? Glorify God, God, glorify God, glorify God, right? Edify the church. Let's throw that in there and show me how I fit into it all. Just to be included in that set is just amazing. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the time and the opportunity to be together today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and our Lord. And Lord, we operate in this kingdom of God, beginning in our hearts and in your church today. And we pray, Lord, that others will see and their hearts will warm and their ears will open and their eyes will open because we are living 
and preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ. That salvation comes through the Christ of God alone. Lord, we listen to your word, how to treat one another inside the church, how to interact with all of those outside of the kingdom so that your kingdom can grow and expand and become the vision that you see. In Jesus' name, Lord, we are yours. And we are right in the middle of it right now, Lord. Please show us the way. Please show us your way. Please show us the way, Lord. As we submit ourselves to you, show us the way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Brothers and sisters, thank you so much. I can't wait to uh, check out all of the uh, messages, comments that you have made, all of the different things. Um, it, it, you know, that's what makes the conversation go. That's what makes the church church. Ask questions. Nothing, you know, let's, let's figure this out. That's why we have the word of God and we have each other and we have those that are in the word of God all the time to help. We help one another understand it all. But let me assure you that you are not an animal. You did not evolve from a monkey. Let me tell you how special you are, created by the Most High God, individually, as our own kind, in His image and His likeness. And He really, truly does desire for you to know Him like he knows you. That relationship. Woo! There is no looking back. So if you're outside of the kingdom of God right now, you're not believing. Open up to John, the gospel of John chapter 1. Talk to us over here. Because time is short. Even if we live an entire lifespan, that's but a blink of an eye. I want you to know eternity. So in Jesus' name, God bless you guys. We should be able to see you tomorrow morning for turning on the lights. To all of our WPFG friends, thank you. We'll see you next Wednesday. If you're interested in turning on the lights, that happens through the Churchtown Church of God Facebook page, Brian D. Warner Facebook page. You can friend me and you can check it out nearly every morning. There are mornings that I take off. Even I get tired. <laughs> 